Welcome to the Sportsman's Voice Podcast, your inside connection to the outdoor legislation. From the beltway to policy happening your way, we're covering it all. I'm your host, Fred Bird. Join us as we explore public land access, wildlife and fisheries management, Second Amendment rights, the triumphs that shape our nation, the sports we all love, and the stories that fuel our passion for the great outdoors. This is the Sportsman's Voice Podcast. Welcome in, everybody, to this new edition of the Sportsman's Voice Podcast, the official podcast of the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. Folks, this week we're going to bring you back in time a little bit to last week where the entirety of the CSF organization descended upon Dewey Beach, Delaware, with all 50 states represented of our National Assembly of Sportsmen's Caucuses. All 50 states joined us in Dewey Beach, our host state of Delaware, did an amazing job of welcoming us and then putting on a, a great show as their hosts. All week we were there discussing policy. We had 16 agencies represented from across the country, directors of those agencies, uh, our agency partners, nonprofit NGO partners in attendance as well, got up and spoke. And it was uh, many days packed full, an agenda packed full of, of, of policy, of ideas moving forward and, and speaking directly to legislators again, from all 50 states, on the betterment uh, going into the new year uh, of our sporting community, how they can engage, how they can get in touch with their constituency and, and be made aware of the issues on the ground, good or bad. And it was pretty awesome. So while there, uh, we took the podcast on the road and we got a whole bunch of sound. We got a whole bunch of different shows for you. Uh, We got some fun stuff. We got a lot of heavy policy uh, conversations we're going to bring to you on this episode. My dear friend, Cuz Strickland of Mossy Oak, he's going to join us. And then Tom Oprey is going to also join us. Tom was in the house from Shepherds of the Wildlife Society where he was allowed, well, we were allowed to get a sneak peek of his latest film the last keeper so cuz coming up followed by tom some of the sound might be seem a little out of sync uh, so i'm giving you some context we recorded these at different parts of the days so if you hear some recall back uh, the way i'm i'm stacking these these conversations for you is, is so that there's some common themes here so for those of you that don't know Cuz, Ronnie Cuz Strickland, he's a prominent personality in the outdoors uh, for decades. Cuz started filming turkey hunts many, many years ago, you know, with the big 20 pound cameras on his shoulder with the VHS tapes. And he was on the front lines of storytelling, of telling our story uh, by way of turkey hunts. And then, you know, that, that evolved. Cuz was on hand to give one of the keynote opening day addresses and if you're a follower of cuz socially you know he's very engaged he's got his fistful of dirt podcast and and somehow over the many years cuz has been able to have his finger on the pulse of of our community the storytelling and how and where that story is being told so again evolving from the days of you know, running around with, with Will Primos and Toxie Hayes and then filming turkey hunts and deer hunts with, you know, heavy equipment to smaller, lighter, equi- lighter equipment, uh, shooting stuff for outdoor television that was wildly expensive to now being on digital mediums, on demand, telling your story in very real time on social outlets, and then recording his podcast because of being able to grow older as a man but stay relevant with the younger demographics. And it's pretty remarkable. So Cuz was able to, to make that case, was able to tell that story and advise our legislators and our, our agency uh, leadership and, and our other partners. All is not lost. And he gives a very good outlook on you know, his perspective and what he thinks. So some of that, in the forthcoming conversation with Cuz and a little more, and then we'll bring in 
uh, the conversation with Tom, uh, introducing the last keeper. And this is, I'll do my best. If you're a history junkie like I am, not a lot of talking from me in the Tom conversation. You guys are going to love this. Hey, Tom is, is fascinating. He's a wealth of knowledge. He knows so much about the stuff he, he's into and the projects that he's involved with, uh, which makes them great. So I'm going to kind of read a little bit directly from the Shepherds of Wildlife Society site, specifically the Introducing the Last Keeper page, just so you kind of get a little understanding of, of what's going on with this show. So in short, the conflict that he's documenting in the Highlands of Scotland, it's competing interests uh, vying for the control of the, the landscape there. The film is character-driven, exploring a disappearing way of life based on hunting, shooting, and the uh, associated conservation role. It's a film that brings the, in the romance and the uniqueness of rural Scottish landscapes, practices, and communities pitted against those who are working to change a way of life. You have this struggle with, with the traditionalists living there that are the gamekeepers. And and Tom goes into that, explains what that all means. And then you have the the big city elites that are trying to encroach and take away these lands. And, and anyway, Tom gets into all that. So all that said, uh, no TSB roundup this week uh, because there's just so much information here. And going forward, as we get through this 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 um, great many of shows from our our 20th annual NAS Summit in Dewey Beach. So that said. Let's get into it with Cuz, and then we'll uh, we'll bring in Tom. Enjoy. All right. Your levels are good. Yes, sir. Sounds good to me. Awesome. <clears throat> Cuz, it's good. It's good to have you here. You and I have done this a number of times. This is the first time you're on the Sportsman's uh, the Sportsman's Voice podcast, and Cuz. Uh, so when the listening audience hears this, this, this NAS summit will already have come and gone, but Cuz did us a a big favor and honor to come down and address a, a whole country full of legislators that are here in Dewey Beach, Delaware, and they're going to be one of our keynote speakers tomorrow. Yeah, I told you, my wife asked me, we were discussing this last night, and she was looking at the agenda, and Richard Childress and all that, and she's like, uh, do you think you're getting out of your lane a little bit? Yeah. And I said, I think we'll be fine. I, I've, I, I spoke to the Mississippi Sportsman's Caucus before, mm -hmm. the hunters, we had a fish fry. I said, I think we'll be fine. And I said, and I said, Fred wouldn't ambush me and throw me in, you know, just throw me under the bus. No. A bunch of regular politicians. These people care. And uh, it's uh, the least you can do is come support them in any which way you can. I mean, we, we all need to do that. I certainly am not going to say no. The, uh, the folks here, I mean, we're, these are your state level senators state level representatives, assemblymen, delegates, wherever you live, whatever the title is. But they're the ones doing the work at the ground level and really affecting all of us where we live. It's not, you know, some of the bigger uh, legislative pieces that happen on Capitol Hill. These are, can you hunt coyotes? Can trapping stay? Can, in certain parts of the country, can you hunt on Sundays? And if you can't, can we get that changed? That, that that's not the stuff happening down in Washington, D.C. That's the stuff happening in your state capitals. And this group that's here uh, gets to hear a bunch of messages over the next three days. They're going to hear your message. And I think uh, you're going to talk about how to communicate with, with our next generation and, and you know, your, your ability. You've, you've tapped into it. And you and I have talked about it so many times. Your years of experience has allowed you to observe and, and talk to people of all ages. And it's and it's, it shows with the success of your podcast, with your social presence, um, you know, talk, talk more about that. Give, you know, the audience is not going to hear what you say tomorrow. So let's, let's give them a little taste of what, uh, all these folks are going to hear tomorrow. <clears throat> well, it's funny cause I, I trust Fred so much. We've done so much together. I, I was jotting a few notes down and I would text him. What about this? What about that? You better run that up to flagpole, but and, now, I, I think my perspective is kind of unique because, uh, I'm, you know, we don't, we don't, I was born in 1954. I was raised in the 60s. That's a very different time. And it was like, 
uh, an anti-hunting issue would never come up back then. It just wasn't on anybody's radar. Right. And where I lived, everybody hunted. Well, it's not like that anymore. So I've enjoyed raising, I, ha- I raised two girls and they have families of their own now. And I have grandkids. Uh, one girl, she's a, a junior at Mississippi State. That's how old I am. <laughs> but the boys are 17, 15, and 11. And I've had them with me a lot. And it's funny, and I don't push anything down their throat. They're all different. Mm-hmm. The, the old, the 17 year old, he's fell in love with duck hunting. And he knows I wouldn't walk across this table to shoot every banded mallard in the <laughs> flyway. That ain't my cup of tea. And I have filmed some of the most gorgeous waterfowl yeah. hunts ever, but I, that's not my thing. Right. Uh, the middle one, Matt, now, and they've all killed turkeys and deer and stuff like that. Matt's, he's, he's loving camping. He'll even go camping some during deer season. Mm-hmm. And I, whatever I could, I, I, I encourage him. I let, I went home the other day and he was sanding on an ax handle on the old, he found an ax that an old garage sale. Took the handle out, put it, and went and bought him a new wooden handle. He was sanding it, get like, how cool is that? Mm. You know, that's outside stuff, cutting and splitting firewood and all that. And I personally, I feel bad for kids and adults much younger than me that didn't get that. They weren't raised in that world. And you can't expect somebody to be all in or what I call a born again hunter mm. if nobody showed them any of that. People get upset. They get mad because uh, that kid's not acting right and all that. You know, one time, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow for a minute, I was guiding this judge. I don't remember. He was a big deal in Missouri. I just remember that. Mm-hmm. he was a, Maybe it was the state Supreme Court judge. And I, he was my client. It was a big fundraiser. And we were turkey hunting, and we didn't kill one that morning, but we got to visit a lot. I said, look, we're going to sit through the lull, <laughs> and we're going to get after him about 930. Had great conversations with him, and I was talking about this thing. This is a long time ago. And he got this wrinkled look on his face, and he said, cuz, he said, I, I'm going to go I'm gonna go check this, but I'm 99.9% sure. He was, a, he was a circuit youth court judge forever. He said, I don't think I ever had an 18 18- year old or younger in front of me in court that had a valid hunting license. Mm. And I went, mm. and I, I can believe that because, yeah. you know, the people that, that do that, I mean, hunting and fishing and all that stuff, trapping, it teaches you so much about perseverance and patience and stick to itness and character. And again, I just feel sorry for people who, uh, who don't get that message. And what I'm going to talk about tomorrow kind of is, uh, hey, we sometimes the politicians, they get a bad rep, and I get it, and they don't think that people are listening. And, and you know, hunters and fishermen are passionate, and sometimes they get they get a little bit too passionate. But they, uh, other than game and fish guys, the game wardens, DNR guys, these these. The, the people in this caucus, they are the front line because you can complain all you want or you can send a letter to the newspaper. Nobody does that. Yeah. You can email. But until it gets in these people's hands and they go, they know how to maneuver all that, and not much is going to change. We need them. We need to support them. And my personal opinion is the younger, really, and I don't know what you call Gen X and below and all that stuff. But these, uh, like Cranky, he's 11, Matt's 15, and Walker, them, those boys stay on top of the issues. Because, mm. uh, you know, I, I talk to him in depth a lot about, you know, the state of the country right now. Every time I look at him, I want to apologize. <laughs> you know how that is. Oh, man. But anyway, we'll have these deep discussions, and now they follow issues, and they'll ask some of the best questions ever. Well, why don't why, what about duck season? Why, why don't we do this now? So I'm pretty, I personally, and you know this, I'm kind of excited for this really young generation to kind of take back over and pick up because I think we kind of lost it during the middle. We got lackadaisical and because uh, things were so good. And now it's a different fight. We were talking on the way up here, you know, and I, I remarked that I, I, I kind of think and I kind of hope we hit a, an apex with 
with the younger um, generation that, you know, all the, the saturation of technology, all this information on an on-demand sort of way, fingertip accessibility, like everything's there. The newness of it certainly was, a, it was, it was, it was magical, right? This is a miracle. You get a miracle in your pocket by way of this phone. You know, I remember Windows 94 and the computer sitting there and my parents finally got one and, you know, we and all that dial up noise and, yeah. and now you got the whole thing. It's like a half an inch thick and it's in your pocket. So when all that stuff come about, I mean, of course it grabbed everyone's attention and, you know, it started almost feeling like a religion. Like people were just always worshiping these, these devices. And to your point, I think the really younger kids, I mean, the, 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 the curiosity is still there and they, they certainly have these tools, but they're using them for, I think their intended purpose, not as a, 24 seven distraction, but because they know how to access the information, they can get the stuff they're interested about. Like, like cranky and, and your other grandsons and, and my son, he says, I, I'm on YouTube and I'm like, my eyes are like, Oh geez, what are we watching? Some other kids playing video games. Oh no, I'm, I'm watching these guys, uh, how to top water fish in Florida yeah. for, for large mouth bass. I was like, Oh, tell me more about that. And then he's watching trapping videos and he'd been live trapping some squirrels. He just wanted to try his hand at it. And all of a sudden just they're taking my my live traps, catching gray squirrels in the backyard. He's like, I want to I want to trap, and he's been doing all this on his own. I was like, well, this is great. I I took him on the trap line when he was real little, but he doesn't remember it. And I show him pictures. Oh, look, we we're catching these raccoons and setting these dog crews, and he has no recollect, but he wants to do it. So anyway, I guess my point is, I think we're I think I, I'm hoping we're on that downside that what's old is new again, and these kids want to be a part of it. I don't think I don't think there's any doubt. It, it's a fight. It's a different kind of fight. And you know, I tell people all the time, I'll do a podcast or I'll make a post, and I, I get lots and lots and lots of comments. Mm. And uh, well, I had one not long ago, and it's like, how do you how do you get those boys to do that? And you could tell they're like, mine are back there in the back room playing whatever they play Fortnite. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> and I said, you got to give them options. You got to give them an alternative, uh, and 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 that takes some work. It's it's no different. Anything that's worth having is worth working for. And if I'm, I'm going to just tell you this, this may be politically incorrect, but little boys want to be little men, mm-hmm. and they have to learn that from men. That's why I try to keep these grandsons. I didn't have to worry about it with my girls because they had the best mom. Ever. She knew she knew everything they needed to know. Mm-hmm. And it made it easy on me because when I was out filming 60 days in a row, they were doing what girls do. And it was fun. But the boys, it's, uh, it's a little different. They, they need to, I, and I got a pretty tight group. I want to make sure mine are around a lot because uh, they're, they're good men. They're, they're really good Christian men. They have values. They have morals. And I want to know how important that is. And I'm going to just tell you, I have been there and done that in many places, different arenas. And I, I'm just convinced the best people in the world are that hunting, fishing, trapping group. They, they, and of course, you're going to have bad apples. You, mm-hmm. you always do. But I'm telling you, day in and day out, they get it. And uh, I think they're to the point now, and that's why I'm always encouraging these older guys to do some social media. because. Not many of them do it at my age, but I'm like, if you want to communicate, you got to send the message where it's at because those phones aren't going anywhere. And after that, you got to send it where they're going to see it because they're not going to be watching TNN Sunday nights at seven Mm o'clock like we used to be on the national network and ESPN. They're not watching that. And I have a really good perspective on that. Like I say, because I had girls, they're grown, they have their own family. Now I've had these grand boys that are getting older and I've watched what really piques their interest. And, you know, mine and yours, bow hunting, trapping, that kind of stuff. Well, Cranky's, he's into the trapping, but the other two, like I say, camping, duck hunting, I don't care what it is as long as they're outside because they're any, you know, you got to compete with the hours they're going to spend on those phones. And, Again, I, I believe that generation, I don't know what you call it, that really young generation, they're starving for somebody to be that rock, somebody that's not trying to sell them something. 
all the time. I've told you the story before about the uh, little boy that came up to me at the NWTF. He couldn't have been 11 or 12. And uh, there was a line there. I was signing some hats. And he got up there and said, Mr. Cuz, he says, I love your podcast. And I went, really? Mm -hmm. He said, yeah. I said, what do you like about it? He said, I like them hunting stories. I ain't got any. And I, again, I thought I was going to start crying, but he was so interested in it. I sat him down over on that stool. We talked for about 20 minutes. His dad didn't hunt. He's had a single mom, bless her heart. She was working two jobs. All she could do. But I'm telling you, it's, a, it's like Gene Winslow says. It's, it's, it's not a sport. It's an instinct. Mm -hmm. Just like breathing and drinking water and breathing air it's an instinct it's in there that hunter gatherer is in there i don't care if you're a girl or a boy or whatever we got to make it easier for them we got to make it more exciting we got to make it cool and because i'm telling you they're interested in it those grandkids of mine all they want to know about is back into that old school stuff they're always digging through trying to find some bottom land i found an old world war ii sock hat the other day cranky went nuts you'd have thought he'd won the lottery it's like they're not interested. They want to know about all that. One of them's hunting with a lever action 30 30 with open sights. Yeah. Because that's what he wants to do. Matt asked me the other day, he said, Papa, I want to kill a deer with a muzzle loader. And I said, Well, I got something for you. Yeah. I unloaded my open the gun safe. I still got my 54 caliber Hulk. Oh, yeah. That classic. Oh, yeah. Back in the day in Mississippi, you had two days you could shoot a, a doe. Because there weren't that many deer when I started. That's how old I am. But uh, And you had to do it with a, a muzzle load. Mm -hmm. And I ain't talking about like, I'm talking about like. Loaded. Real deal. Number 11 percussion cap. That's loaded it. with the I hatch. Had, I still got some 54 caliber buffalo bullets. Mm -hmm. Hollow point, hollow base, the grease and all that stuff. And he's now he's fascinated. He wants to kill his deer with uh, the muzzle loader, And I'm going to do everything I can for him. But. I'm telling you, the, the audience is out there. It's primed, not just in hunting. I think across the country, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people getting tired of how things are going because I'm, I, I tell you, I have a good perspective on, because I'll spend, because my house is kind of an empty nest when the kids ain't up there. Thank God, Lauren's my youngest daughter. They live out there. So the kids are there all the time. But at night, I make a post and I'll get whatever. I may get 20 comments. I may get 1,000. And I'll go through and read them. And you can keep your finger on the pulse of what people are thinking because uh, they're, they're just being very honest about, you know, their feelings and stuff. I'm pretty careful about what I post. But, you know, people, uh, they won't. I tell them all the time, they want to live this lifestyle. And that's why I always <clears throat> talk about, hey, if you, if you want to do something, take somebody, be a mentor, and that's a lot of work. Mm. But don't pick a kid. And they'll look at me and go, why? I said, because if you take an 11-year-old and get him fired up and hooked, well, once you're done, he's done. Take his dad or his brother. Somebody's got a driver's license. I got a good look at that with the NDA, formerly QDMA. Mm -hmm. You know, they had that field of fort program. <clears throat> and uh, I was on the board, still on the board of directors technically till this month since 2016. Mm -hmm. And I watched they did the field of fork thing. They'd go to these uh, farmer's markets and cook venison while everybody was selling it. And people would come over and, I mean, I would love to do that. Even first thing you know, they have a hunt. And they're bringing these people in who knew nothing. And you talking about a diverse crowd. Now, these people, this was a diverse crowd. Purple hair, Asians, I mean, across the board. And, and, I, and I talked and talked and talked. And all, that, it was all about the food. And the deer hunting kind of hung them up because they could see themselves turkey hunting and throwing a turkey over the shoulder because they eat one at Thanksgiving. What was hanging them up on the deer hunting is what to do after it's on the ground. And that's what we worked on. And six or eight out of the first one has like 20 people and six or eight of them killed a deer with a crossbow. And then we went through the whole thing, field dress and all that. And they had a huge... I don't know what the percentage was. <clears throat> Coming back, it was like 89% came to the another, and then they're teaching other people. And, and some hunters will say, well, there's enough people hunting. This public ground is too crowded. They just don't keep up with the math. You know, they really don't. And, <clears throat> and I'm not saying one of these days, it's, you're going to walk into the voting booth and it's going to be on there. 
But I'm telling you, you're going to walk into the voting booth one day and that agenda is going to be up there. Okay. No, I mean, there's not even half the country has the right to hunt and fish on the on their um, state constitution that's not been amended. I, I forget the number we're at, but we're close to half. But that's 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 not enough. We need all 50 states, right? Yeah. So that's where we're, we're here and these are things we're talking about. We're working on campaigns on in the states where we don't have that. And, the, you know, the audience here knows because they've heard it, but. You know, for for your audience that may not know it, now that's a that can that's a concerted effort. We talk about this in the community that this needs to happen to protect our traditions, our way of life, the people yet to come. But there's a huge effort, and and that's educating the people that we're here with, the state legislators, because even they don't know, they can't possibly know everything. So we're doing our best, you, me, Corinne, our staff, to to uh, educate, to advocate for our community. Right. On, and then let them know this is what you can do as, as in your position, in your power. You've been elected. Here's how you can help. And what we found with our organization is the, the biggest bipartisan and bicameral organization in the entire country. And it's made of hunters and outdoorsmen and outdoors women. That's a big deal. When we cast aside the D's and the R's and the I's and everything in between you want to put next to it. And we focus on, you and I have talked about this a million times. Focus on what matters. We all want to hunt. We all want to fish. Most of us want to trap. We want to go out to wild places. That doesn't seem overly political to me. That seems very basic. Like you said, it's, it's in us. It's instinctual. This is what I fight daily, kind of in my inner circle and on social media and all that. It's easy for, I'm going to say guys, because you'd be astounded at my uh, analytics on social media. On Instagram, I have whatever it is, 50-something thousand followers, and it's 99.2% male, and it's like 80% between 18 and 35. That's, that's young. That's really young. And uh, that group right there, they're willing to fight. There's a lot of people my age and a little bit younger. It's, e it's so much easier to give up. Say, I'm done with politics. Mm -hmm. They're all crooked. All well, you can't do that. You got to convince people, look. Don't don't get involved in the left versus the right. Start with your local and your county and your district and get involved and just do some homework. See who thinks like you do and start making some. But get on social media and say, I'm both. For, man, I got it. I, 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 put, I made a post not long ago in a governor's race. And I had a guy call me because you, you're going to lose a bunch of followers out of So I don't care. I know where he stands on the Second Amendment. And I've seen him duck hunt. I, I'm good with that. So, you know, people are scared to do this and scared to do that. And you're right. It's, it's all going to take place in some state capital somewhere, and they ain't going to know anything about it. And all of a sudden, they're going to start complaining again. But they, they were the ones that didn't show up to the voting booth. And, I'm, again, I'm excited to, to talk about that tomorrow with these people right here because Again, I have a pretty unique perspective, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a fight. But I, I'm telling you, I think the Army is prime. Mm. I really do. And you even alluded to it earlier. You know, you said that people used to write letters to the editor of a newspaper, or mm. they send an email now. It doesn't take but three to five people to, to contact one legislator to get them fired up because they don't, they don't get calls. They're no one calls their... No one calls our local legislator on these things because they think it doesn't matter, the, the constituency, and just, and most people honestly don't know who their legislator is. That's right. So you're talking about doing your homework. You can at least be involved in the process by knowing who represents you in your town or your county, whatever it is. And then, yeah, if you have, if you're passionate, you and four of your buddies, that's all it takes. Send the emails or leave voice messages. And all of a sudden, these people are like, holy smokes, something big's happening down in this town, we got to act because they don't like getting their feathers ruffled, especially if it's something negative. Yeah, it's a, uh, if they would spend as much energy on the internet, finding out who their local people are and all, as they do in the barbershop, complaining about it <laughs> every morning drinking coffee, it'd be a different world. But that, that's the fight, is getting people to realize it's not going to take place by a posted sign out there on a piece of public ground on an old country road. It's going to be in the legislature. Yeah. That's where you're going to win or lose. And that's why when you asked me to come speak, I said, yeah, I, I can't wait to give them my perspective as a 
almost 70 year old guy who grew up in this and now has little kids. I say little kids. I got kids around me all the time and to see what interests them. And they are interested in it because it's real. Uh, I had a guy and I recorded a podcast yesterday for that. Actually, I did two. And uh, he's got a huge YouTube channel, almost 4 million subscribers. Oh, it's deer meat for dinner. I'll go ahead and tell you it is. His name's Robert Harrington. But he went through the trouble. He got one of the head executives from YouTube down to his ranch. Really? Yeah. This guy's pretty pretty amazing. And and the guy brought his little girl, and, and this guy's got two girls. And they kind of sat around, ate lunch, and they went out riding in the buggy, and they were chasing pigs. And then he got them to the rifle range, and they were plinking with a little twenty two at 20 yards. This guy's from, like, New York City. Had never even touched a gun. And he's plinking and plinking. And then he finally got him out to about 200 yards with like a 223 or something. So they were going to walk down there and check the target they shot at. So he unbolted the gun. It's empty. set it on the rest. And he said, while we were walking down there, he said, I turned and told him, he said, uh, now if that gun goes off and starts shooting, you go to the left and I'll go to the right. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? Well, his point being, we have a people problem. We don't have a yeah. gun problem. Right. And by the end of the thing, the guy was giving him this expression like, that blows my mind mm. and it changed his mind. But he went through all the trouble to do that. And now I'll guarantee it, YouTube has relaxed some of their guidelines mm. because it is the right thing to do. It's perfect, like Ted Nugent says. And just because some people are offended about it, well, you know what? Like the lady said, I watched the <laughs> script the other day. Somebody like, you offend, you're going to offend these people. She said, hey. Life is hard. Wear a helmet. <laughs> we got to speak up and yeah. say, th th I'm not going to back down from somebody who thinks what we do is wrong because it's not. And even if my world is my three or four little grandkids, most of the time, I do get opportunities and I have a vehicle just like you do to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, if somebody gets offended, then they get offended. I'm, I'm okay with choosing sides when it comes to the hunting, fishing, trapping stuff because I've been through the heyday. Mm -hmm. I, I've been through the, the grand season of turkey hunting back in the early 80s to the early 90s and all that. And, and the only reason it was so much better back then is because everybody was trapping. Mm -hmm. and people don't want to hear that. They don't want to do away with their little cute rocky raccoon. Well, they're devastating not only the the turkeys, but qu any kind of bird. Sure, that ground nesting birds. Ground nested birds. And those are just cold, hard facts. And uh, so what, whatever we can do to spread the word is, is a good thing. But like I say, it's, uh, the, the battle, if it comes, it ain't going to be in your backyard because you got a BB gun. It's going to be in that state capitol building mm -hmm. somewhere. And what's pretty remarkable without being hyperbolic is that when you talk to these folks, they, again, doesn't matter what's in front of their, their name. They truly want to help. They're here because they want to learn what they don't already know. And when you can engage them, they're like, oh, I just, I just never knew that. Yeah, this makes perfect sense. Or if a piece of legislation comes up that another constituency, like you said, if, if, if we don't speak, someone's going to speak for us. And they say, well, we, we want to do away with this. And then we get wind of it. So, well, here's the butterfly effect if you, if you do do away with that. And again, they don't know. So then we tell them and they're like, things start to make sense. But like, to your point, again, it's, we got to say it because if we don't, someone else is doing it for us and it's not going to always go our way that way. I've always been real guilty because I'm just a likable guy that I've always assumed everybody knows and thinks like I do. Yeah. Like I've got a circle of buddies and everybody's at the, whatever, the NWTF convention here that you think you're around like-minded people who know all these facts and you're not. And when that hit on with me, when my granddaughter, like I say, she's a so she's a junior now at Mississippi State. She, we were one time we were catfishing. This wasn't about the social media thing, but we uh, we caught eight or ten nice blue cats, two or three pounds. And then we went over there, and I had a water hose and a board with a nail in it, and all that stuff. We skinned them, filleted them, took them over there. Miss Pam made a one. We we fried the fish outside. She made hush puppies and all that stuff. And we're sitting there, it's just me and my wife and my granddaughter. I don't know where the boys were. And she's sitting there and she gets this puzzled look on her face. She said, hey, Pop, she said, 
we caught those fish and we cleaned those fish. Now we're eating those fish. Mm. She said, that's pretty cool, isn't it? And I went, yeah, that, that's where they come from. You know, I had a lady even sit next to me one time in Albuquerque at the airport. We've been out there trying to film an elk hunt. And if I remember, I was very unsuccessful and very tired of toting that big camera. She, I, I had some camo something, a bag or something, and she leaned over and she said, do you hunt? And I said, yes, ma'am. And I said, we've been out here trying to film an elk hunt. And boy, she went off for like seven, eight, nine minutes. And I was nodding my head, talking about how cruel, blah, blah, blah. And I said, how long have you been vegan? She said, what? I said, well, I'm assuming you don't eat meat. She said, well, yeah, I eat meat. So I said, so it's okay to shoot a steer in the head with a waden stake out of an air gun so you can go to McDonald's, but you don't want us chasing something that's, that's been exactly eaten. exactly right. Can, and she looked me straight in the eye and said, that's different. Well, you may never reach her, and that's okay. I mean, there's always going to be this side versus that side. But what we got to reach is the the people who have kind of pull back and won't get involved anymore. And it's going to be in the political arena. As much as I hate to say it, that's where it's going to come down to. And that's why it's so important for people to keep up with the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus because that, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. You know, you ain't going to, you're not going to run up in the White House or in the, in the National Capitol building and then make your point. You got to do it down at that grassroots level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. All right. Um, as we're wrapping up here, and I appreciate you taking the time here, you got in late to uh, to Dewey Beach, cause what do you hope the audience takes away from you tomorrow? You know, I yeah, I don't know. I've never spoke to the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus. You you're bra you're very brave for bringing me up here, Fred. <laughs> but you know, I do anything for you. I appreciate you. You are very high on my totem pole. But I'm gonna tell them. I'm gonna tell them some stories, and I'm gonna let them know that. Every person matters. And if you'll learn to listen and take things serious, you, you'll educate yourself. I, I, want them, I want them to leave going, man, I didn't know that. I didn't know those youngsters were that passionate about it. And it's easy to get caught up in that day-to-day. -day. You can't imagine how busy. I'm, I, I can imagine how busy they are. It's a tough world right mm -hmm. now. And, you know, you, you throw hunting and fishing and trapping and all that stuff out there. And sometimes they may not have time for it. I'm going to try to make them understand how important it is because it, it isn't about, uh, you know, just hunting and fishing and trapping. It's about uh, a lifestyle and character and patriotism and stuff that I feel like is still very important. And apparently I think they do too, but they wouldn't be going through what they're going through. It takes a lot of grit to be a congressman or a state senator or something. It sure does. I, I, and I got some examples, and I'm going to talk about them tomorrow. I learned once you get your opinion out there that uh, you're going to have some negative constant. You're going to have some blowback, and I've, I've got a couple of examples I ain't going to believe, and, uh, but I've never been scared to, to throw that out there. So I, I hope when they leave, they understand that my perspective is fairly unique because I have some big vehicles now, and I'm an older guy, and I've watched two generations grow up through this, and I'm just, I, I promise you, I think the Army is ready to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And if that's the 18-year-old, so be it. Because there's, there's, like I say, there's a lot of people my age who like, nah, you know, it, I'm, my vote ain't going to make any difference. Or, Well, it would. But anyway, that's, that's what I'm going to try to get across is, your your audience is out there, and they're they're wanting information, and they want you to do the right thing for hunting and fishing. So that's going to be the gist of my talk. Is like, hey, let's let's all do the right thing. It's an important message, and I think uh, you'll have a, a very captive audience. They're not going anywhere for one. Yeah, like, they they that's the best kind, man. <laughs> they uh, they're excited. We're excited that you're here. And um, I think I think once that message gets across, because uh, you'll have a, a group of people that are in your age demo, some younger and some, quite frankly, older, um, that are willing to pick that up and work with a younger group, and we'll see the value in that. I'm going to end with a story that's really got nothing to do with the legislative issues and all, but it's it's going to let. Th I, I hope they'll feel 
how you can experience things outdoors you can't get anywhere else that just don't happen anywhere else. I, I'm going to tell them the story about Ryan the Rock Welch. That it was the third kid from Catcher Dream we took. And I'm telling you, I watched this miracle in front of my eyes for three days. And I'm going to close it with that. And if nothing else, they'll remember. And that little kid's still alive. Mm. He's 28 years old now. And he was eight years old. He was not expected to do well. And we went hunting for three days and watching him change before my eyes. I just want him to know that it's that important. Hey, if you can't, if you can't do 10,000 people at a time, do one at a time. Yeah. Anyway, that's my hope. I may get booed out of the place. I doubt. <laughs> we, we shall see. I love a captive audience. Yeah, you got them. Because as always, thank you so much for, for all you do for our community and certainly uh, answering the call when I, I make it. I'm always there for you, Fred. You know where you're at on my totem pole. You're way up at the top. Thank you for all the hard work, and God bless the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus. I'm going I'm to do a better job, too. I'm going to start making some – I'm going to start rattling the cages and rocking the boat a little bit and see if we can't get some more people involved. But thank you for the invite. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks so much to Cause uh, for his time, uh, for, for coming to Dewey Beach, for, for standing up there, entertaining our audience. Uh, you know, you heard there, he referenced what, you know, what he was going to be talking about the next day. And, and obviously that was our, our opening morning crowd loved him. I, I want to say out of the time he had to speak, a great majority of it was spent laughing in the audience, uh, because cause is that way. And it was all very relevant and all had, it was poignant, but you know, in an entertaining way, driving that point home, um, little teary eyed maybe there a couple times and it, you know cuz kind of touched on some of that in the conversation here really grabbed the uh, grabbed the audience in the room 200 plus people sitting in that room and uh, and drove the point home so cuz is is a treasure a national treasure uh in our space to be sure um always looking forward always advocating for our rights, working with people, trying to communicate that, and, and definitely doing so with the up-and-coming young folks as they come into adulthood and they have their own kids and, and perpetuating this, but staying current. He's a dear friend, and I always appreciate when he takes my call. And when I put an ask to him, he's like, yeah, how can I help? And he's like that with everybody uh, that, that is out here working for the, the betterment of the sporting community at large. So um, it was great having him, and thanks so much, Cuz, uh, for all you do for our community. Up next, as I said in the intro, uh, we're going to welcome in Tom Opre. We're going to talk about The Last Keeper, his latest film that is, is coming out. We got a, a sneak peek uh, at our little movie night there um, at the, at the NAS Summit, as I said in the intro. Uh, it looks to be one heck of a film. Those of you that are able, they're going to be able to see it are probably going to really enjoy it. If you're a history nut, uh, this is right up your alley that brings in current day conservation conflict and issues. And, you know, this isn't just stuff we deal with, you know, looking overseas, especially where the North American model of wildlife conservation doesn't exist, but some of the people understand the tenets of it and try to implement that anyway lots of competing ideologies lots of competing motive motivations here tom's gonna break it down only in the only way he can uh so sit back relax i feel like you need to grab a a bourbon maybe or you know a fine dark uh whiskey something uh to listen to this i was certainly you know captivated with uh, tom and his storytelling ab ability and just the enthusiasm that he brings i think you're going to get that definitely through your speakers if if we had an audio a visual of this yeah you'd be hitting the ties you'd be drawn right in it's like okay i'm ready to go put brave heart on and and get my scotland on and start thinking about red deer and 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 how you know how this can all be protected but anyway let's bring in tom i hope you guys enjoy this conversation let's go all right uh the the NAS summit continues, and, and it's not all policy and heavy talk. We do have some entertainment for our guests and our legislators, and welcome in 
Ken, filmmaker, director, Tom Overy with the Shepherds of Wildlife. You, Tom and I have talked before in the past, and he's done a, a number of wonderful films, and we have the pleasure of seeing a bit of uh, a new film tonight here. Uh, for the listening audience, this won't be relevant the date, but for us it is. Welcome to the program, sir. Fred, it's always a pleasure to be here. I know we've had a chance to talk in the past about wild turkey conservation yeah. and, and the science around that. But uh, yeah, we're really kind of going in a little bit different uh, a different angle here. You know, science is king, right? When it mm-hmm. comes to wildlife and habitat conservation, we have to have a common denominator that I think we all can agree on. So peer-reviewed science is, is absolutely important. And so what we've, we've started working on about three years ago, uh, Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, called me up and said, hey, we'd like you to come and talk to our, our state legislative summit. And I said, well, what, what is that exactly? Mm-hmm. And of course, they explained to me that, uh, you know, it's the largest caucus in Congress, the Sportsman's Caucus, the largest number of, of, of congressmen and women. But also now, as of last year, there's 50 states that have right. Sportsman's Caucuses, which is really important because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, living in a representative democracy, elections have consequences. Mm-hmm. and Bad and good laws start at the local level. Mm -hmm. And by having an opportunity to come speak to the state legislators that are part of the Sportsman's Caucus from states, you know, I mean, we've got uh, several hundred people here usually. And so it's a great opportunity for me to talk to these people face to face about kind of really what the reality is on the ground for the people who Mm -hmm. practice, you know, conservation, the wise use of our natural resources. And really, our whole story behind the Shepherds of Wildlife Society is that. Our essence is we're made up of wildlife photographers and outdoor filmmakers. And our goal is, is you know, we out, we're outside, we're seeing what's going on. Uh, we're seeing man's impact on the world. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, worldwide, but also here throughout the United States. And we're seeing that some good things going on. Sure. And, but where we do see things that are going in the right direction is where we have what I call modern conservation, our North American conservation model being a, a, an example of that, where wildlife provides a value to people. And when people see that the wildlife provides a value, they take care of it. Sure. And that is, the, that is ultimately what we do here in the United States. And, and uh, you know, we've been doing, practicing that for about 130 years, I guess, you now since yeah. guys like George Bird Grinnell and Teddy Roosevelt yeah. in the late 1880s said, hey, let's usher in this idea that if we take care of things, we'll have it forever. That's, that's exactly You know, right. that's modern conservation ethos. So I you know, went to Little Rock, Arkansas three years ago, and at the time we had a film called Killing the Shepherd, which was about... Uh, it is about a uh, rural community in Zambia led by a woman chief, which is fairly rare for that area, mm-hmm. uh, who wanted to break the bonds of poverty by waging a war against uh, illegal wildlife poaching in her area. And uh, it wasn't the ivory or the rhino stuff that makes all the headlines. It was bushmeat poaching, which right. is a $2 billion black industry. at a uh, You know, it, it, people consider it a right in the cities to be able to eat bushmeat. Uh-huh. And bushmeat just means any kind of dried wild game. It could be a primate, it could be a hippo, it could be a kudu, it could be a lion. Whatever they're catching. In Whatever the they can kill, mm-hmm. they kill it, dry it, because they make money. Uh-huh. And so it kind of harkens back a little bit to our our, uh, our market hunting right. place here on this continent. And, uh, you know, we you know at the time, our ancestors thought that the resources were unlimited. Right. We didn't realize it was very finite. And we came to understand that, like I mentioned, in the late 1800s, wiser heads prevailed. And so now we're in a, in a world with 8 billion humans on the planet. Well, who's going to take care of these wildlife resources? Who's going to take care of the habitat? You know, and, it, and, and what we've come to understand over thousands of years of human history, wildlife only exists when humans take care of it. Uh-huh. And you know, we've got thousands of examples of human history where we've pretty well mucked the place up. Case in point, look at North America. Uh-huh. But, you know, if you take care of this wildlife, it'll take care of you. And that's exactly what we've been able to see with these rural communities. And, and so we do these films about rural communities. We want to give them a voice on the world stage. So these are mainstream feature documentaries. And uh, it, it, it's, we're not trying to say, you know, is hunting good or bad or is rewilding or ranching or any of these other subject matters that come around kind of that rural lifestyle, that rural life. Uh, What we want to do is give these people an opportunity to express their relationship with the land and with the creatures that live on it and how it provides for them. Because, you know, for a long time, you know, the last 100, 120, 30 years, you know, sportsmen, hunters and fishermen have raised a lot of money for conservation. You know, Pippin Robertson, you got Johnson Dingleax. I mean, I think Pippin Robertson raised over a million and a half, or billion and a half dollars last year alone. 
uh, for wildlife conservation. Uh, you know, we talk about millions of acres that are saved or conserved. We talk about millions of animals brought back from the brink of extinction. Those are great stories of conservation. But honestly, Fred, it doesn't mean anything to the 39-year-old housewife in Welcome, New Jersey. To them, it's all about the warm and fuzzy. Mm-hmm. So when you talk about killing an animal, it's, it appalls out. Sure. You know, the vast majority of Western world, when they get up in the morning, they flip a switch and they expect the lights to come on. They don't have any idea where electricity comes from. They don't care as long as the light's on. The next decision is to walk in the bathroom, flush the toilet out of sight on morning. The next decision of the day is, is it a chai latte or a caramel macchiato? That's right. Where does wildlife fit in that? Uh Where does wildlife habitat fit in that? It doesn't. Yet these people are basically uh, in the world of social media, they are susceptible to messaging. And we know that there are a group of very, very uh, well-funded anti-hunting, anti-use groups in the United States alone. I think the last time I saw the data, uh, anti-hunting groups based on their 990 tax returns generate about a billion dollars yeah. every year in funding from people that think they're doing conservation, which is the wise use of an asset resource. But we all know those groups are not conservationist groups. Those are preservation. Exactly. So they, they come at it with the idea that they think Mother Nature is going to you know, be free and everything's going to be wonderful. And unfortunately, that's not how things work, especially with the amount of humans we have in the landscape. Uh, if we're not managing, and in this fact, we've been managing the, the planet for a long time good, bad, or indifferent, you know, we've got our thumbprint over every square Mm. inch of this planet. I like to say you go to the highest point of the earth, which is Mount Everest. Of course, you'll find all kinds of trash, used (laughs) oxygen bottles, I think over 120 dead bodies. Yeah. Uh, And you go to the lowest point of the earth, the Marianas Trench in the South Pacific. And I've always said ever since the um, Fukushima nuclear reactor tsunami deal in Japan, that, you know, you know, but shit goes downhill, right? Yeah. And so, of course, National Geographic did a, uh, did a study some years ago where they uh, they basically sampled the biological creatures in the, in the trench, and they found that they've been exposed to more uh, and worse pollutants than the most polluted rivers in China today. That's wild. I spent a lot of time in China, and, and there, there is no EPA in China. Right. You know? and, uh, and, of course, you know, they're also the, the emitter of the vast majority of, of CO2, you know, over 30% of the world. So you know, those are the things that we have to think about. You know, how are we going to leave this planet? Are we leave it better than we found it? Well, that's our goal with the Shepherds of Wildlife Society. And so it's been such a wonderful opportunity to be here with CSF, to be here with the various state legislators and the other speakers at this conference. Uh, as I mentioned, we were here three years ago. Uh, we came back again last year to tease them a little bit on a film we're doing in Scotland called The Last Keeper. And uh, we're just wrapping up that film. And so uh, the legislators are going to get a chance to get a sneak peek on what we're working on. But this isn't outdoor television. This mm-hmm. is a hunting and fishing show. This is a story where mainstream documentary where we're telling the story of these rural Highlanders. Again, their relationship with the land. And in some cases, it, it, it spans, you know, thousands, hundreds of years mm-hmm. where families have lived on these, on these estates and they have managed it for wildlife. And the idea is, uh, you know, if we take care of the land and we, we take the resource and we, and we do some uh, prescribed burning or, or what they call uh, muir burn there uh, on the heather moorlands. And if we go ahead and suppress ground predators, and it sounds kind of interesting, right? It's exactly the same thing you do in southeastern <laughs> United States for, for wild quail and turkeys Turkey, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And of course, where we do that, we see, you know, very healthy populations, very healthy biodiversity, uh, very healthy landscapes and ecosystems. Well, over there, because of the uh, historical biases, um, you know, you, you, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the history of it, but you basically have class warfare going on. And uh, it's this classic urban versus rural mm-hmm. uh, war that we see in a lot of places throughout the world where you have uh, a much greater population in the cities and those, in those urban areas. They obviously, in these representative democracies, 50% plus one wins at the end of the day. Yep. So you have these people that can get the, the, the ear of the politicians, and these people have no clue what goes on in the highlands, just like they have no clue what goes on in ranches in Montana. They have no clue what goes on in, in hunting concessions in Africa. They have no clue what goes on in a plantation in South Georgia. But they have a per, this perception over right. there that because it's owned by a landowner and the history of Scotland, you know, most of the U.K., uh, you know, you've got this feudal land system that's come along. They haven't had a revolution like we had or like, you know, several or a couple of revolutions they've had in France. Uh, you know, they, they have people that have literally had families that have owned land for a thousand years. Yeah. You know, well, since, you know, 1066 when William the Conqueror came. 
when the Normans came over and conquered uh, what is now the United, well, what is now Great Britain, uh, you know, they, they brought the feudal land system in here. So what you ended up with is, is a situation where you, you had clans in Scotland, and of course it was community land at the time. And so people, you know, they did community grazing. And most of these people were subsistence farmers that lived on the landscape. And there wasn't a lot of people in Scotland. Uh-huh. Uh, let's face it, the, the uh, ability, the fertile ability of, of the land in the highlands to produce is not what it is in yeah. the south of England. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> big difference, you yeah. know. And it's just like what our ancestors dealt with. Like my family, uh, you know, came into the, the, the Northeast and, uh, you know, colonized New England. And, of course, you go there hunting turkeys today and you'll find, uh, you know, old building remnants and, and old cemeteries that are just completely covered up with huge, mature, uh, deciduous trees. Our mm-hmm. stone walls. Yeah, the stone walls and stuff. You're like, well, who was here? Well, it's because somebody was trying to eke out a living. And right. they, they cut all those trees down and tried to figure out. But the soil there isn't very good for growing whatever crops they were trying to grow back there in the 1617 and early 1800s. And they started moving west. Mm-hmm. Where did they end up? In the breadbasket of America, the Mississippi River Valley. Yeah. You know? And so that's where most of our, you know, food production comes now. You know, they went to where the soils were good. And so in the highlands, you just, you just don't have the ability to, to generate a lot of revenue on these properties. And uh, so historically, you, you know, had these clans that, you know, these guys, you know, they wanted people raised up in the Glen, which is the valley, uh, because they would, you know, the Earl would call up and say, hey, we need to go fight against these people. Because there was always the oppressed and the oppressors, and you always had Vikings or somebody trying to come along mm-hmm. and take whatever you had. Because the Vikings lived in another part of the world across the way that was even worse than where mm-hmm. the highlands are as far as, you know, the ground being, uh, you know, being very productive. And so you have a scenario where you get to, I mean, I don't know if people have watched the TV show Outlander, uh, but in, in 1747, you had the Battle of Culloden, which was uh, the Jacobites were rising up and, you know, you had two different families fighting to be the king of, of Great Britain. Uh, so the King of Scotland, the King of Wales, you got the King of, of, of England. Of course, the King of England was in charge of everything, and they wanted to have uh, another family, the, the, uh, the Stuarts, which was Bonnie Prince Charlie, comes across. He'd been, you know, moved over to, to France and kicked out of the way earlier, though they had had several kings of England prior to then. And so they had this uprising, and, and, uh, and this battle occurs, and so the, the, the English king wins and, uh, you know, massacres the Jacobites. And, of course, the English weren't just English redcoat troops fighting in 1747, but they also had their allies that were Scots wearing their tartans and everything else. But what came of that was a change in land use. They went away from that clan pastoral, you know, system to a landowner. So the clan leader now became the laird, and laird means landowner. And, but also the King of England banned the use of Gaelic language, which is Scottish, uh-huh. and did away with the, the, the tartans and the bagpipes and all stuff, which the tartans and the bagpipes is more of a, a, a more recent history thing. It's not a long, long history, but did away with all that. And, uh, and basically, the, instead of having communal grazing, you know, the, the, the idea was, well, I, I need this estate to make money. Of course, the king wants to get his part. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and then the estate owner who lives on this non-fertile, not very fertile ground is hanging out with his buddies that have estates down in the South of England is, which is extremely fertile. And of course their kids are going to Oxford and, you know, everywhere else. And they're off to Paris playing every weekend and things like that. Uh, and you know, we're talking, this is, this is just at the start of the industrial revolution. And so people are getting around and traveling, going places. Well, they don't have that kind of money. Well, if you have these subsistence farmers on your, on your estate, you might get seven or eight pounds a year from all of them in the Glen. But if I remove those people and I move them in the town and try to educate them and give them a skill set, and then, you know, because these people are, I mean, they're no different than what I saw in Africa when I was working in Zambia on the Killing the Shepherd Project, where you have these subsistence farmers that, I mean, they're living in a thatch roof hut, same thing, Scotland. Um, you know, they, they have dirt floors, same thing. And in case in Scotland in the wintertime, you're wild, you're, you're, you're wild, not wild, but your, your domestic stock, your, the few sheep you have, the few cows you have, a horse or something, live inside the house with you in the wintertime eh. so that you can stay warm and they can stay warm. No kidding. Oh yeah. No, I've seen houses that are all designed for, you know, basically it has a little livery inside a, a third of the houses yeah. and it's all open, you know, and they've got places, you know, it's, it's fascinating what happens. So the long story to, is, is that it's very similar to what I saw in Africa, these subsistence people. So if you could get these people out, it sounds like a good idea, right? You know, Hey, I can help these people out. They can go in the town. They can have a, a real house to live in. They can get a job. But you're also talking about people that have lived on the land in some cases for maybe a thousand years. 
their family have been in that place? How do they assimilate to something like well, that? Well, what happened in that at that point is certain landowners said, well, we're going to move these people I'll come hell or high water because I can get 800 pounds a year from the sheep farmer who mm-hmm. will put 5,000 sheep in the glen. So if I get rid of the people, and that's what they call the highland clearances. So if you're listening to this and you happen to have Scottish ancestry of any kind, you most probably here in North America, it came from that time period. Your no, kids came over here because they wholesale packed up people. Uh, they burned people out of their homes. Mm-hmm. Now, what, now, it wasn't all terrible, and it wasn't over all of Scotland either. But it were certain places where certain landowners basically said, hey, this is the way it's going to be come hell or high water. And some of them, the landowners said, here's your ticket. And a lot of people put out, were put on ships to go to the new land. You know, ended up in, in Nova Scotia. Ended up in, Yeah, that's where my family's yeah, from. Yeah, exactly. So if you got Scottish blood in you, that's most probably when it happened. Why? Uh, and so, of course, you know, they also ended up over in, in Australia and New Zealand and places like that. Scots did. Uh, and so what you have now is that total change of land ownership. You have different use of the land. Because there was no sheep really on the land. I mean, there, and there wasn't very many people. And so you have this land that's kind of evolved. And, and the other thing, too, it's really fascinating. Well, well you get to the situation where in 1750 to about the early 1800s, you had the clearances. And then what you ended up with in the mid-1800s, Queen Victoria and her husband, Albert, uh, Prince Albert, she was supposed to go on vacation over on the continent. And they couldn't go over there for whatever reason. So they went up to, to the highlands. And she absolutely fell in love with it. And she bought Balmoral. Mm. which we've all heard of Balmoral, right? And that's where the queen or the king goes. That's their summer haunts and whatnot. And it's a very large estate up there. And that put things just in perspective for everybody. You know, we're here in Delaware. It's not a very big place. Right. Um, you know, I'm from Montana. And we kind of figured out we could put five United Kingdoms inside of Montana. <laughs> so, but Scotland is the landmass of New Jersey with between four and five million people. Well, not a very... Yeah, it's a lot of people, but it's not, but they're all, I want to say, yeah, not a big place, but they all live in a band between Glasgow and Edinburgh and the side, you know, basically the southern part of Scotland or, you know, the Midlands, basically. And, um, and it's those people that dictate the policy. Mm -hmm. So uh, we talk about the clearances. You had a group of people who decided they had a better idea of how to use the land because they wanted to make more money so they could go play with their, their rich friends down south in, in London. Today, or the last 20 years, we've seen a, a movement to rewild the land. Now, let's go back in history. 9,000 years ago, Scotland was covered in ice, glacial ice. Mm-hmm. You have the climate warm. You have trees, plant life, and animal life colonize the land. Of course, you know, humans came with the animals. And that is kind of the, you had probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80, maybe even 90% of the land mass was covered in trees. But you're talking about a land that gets about 60 inches of rain a year on average. And what the ecologists, the scientists will tell you is that if you have plant life that's growing like that with that much rain in that particular soil in that, that area, you get acidification of the soil. Right. And you get an iron hard pattern in certain places that grow up and trees just don't grow very well there. And again, you remember, you know, so we had the Battle of Culloden. We had the king come over in 1750. The king of England commissioned a, a military survey of all the trees in Scotland. And they determined only about 5% of of all the landmass had trees on it. So the reason why I bring it up is you have, everybody knows you see Outlander, you see some of these other movies have been shot in the highlands of Scotland. You see these beautiful kind of rocky crags with this heather moorland that kind of stretches all over. It kind of looks like tundra. Yeah. And uh, it turns purple when the flower's out. It's beautiful in the summertime in August. And, uh, but that is the naturally occurring wilderness of the Highlands of Scotland. So we talked about these rewilders. So what is rewilding? Well, it means a lot of things to a lot of different people, but this, this actual movement is the fact that they would like to see the land be better. And this quote unquote from the chairman of the trees for life, like to see the land better than before we were here, i.e. humans. We'll try to figure that one out. I, I couldn't figure it out. But also the CEO of the John Muir Trust, a um, guy named David Belhari, very interesting individual, did several interviews with him. Uh, his goal was to let trees be free. If they, don't, if they don't grow there, how can they be free? Well, if you're planting the trees, that was my question, because that's mm-hmm. what they're doing is planting trees all over. So what's the motivation? Are you selling trees? No, the real motivation, well, we're going to get to that. Okay, all right. So I think the motivation is very, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with trees, doesn't have anything to do with wildlife, doesn't have anything to do with anything other than it has to do with who owns the land. Mm-hmm. And really, that's what it comes down to is, is that you have, you can go back in any Scots history, 
one side or the other, eventually you're going to find the oppressed or the oppressors. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course with the land being the way it is and you have these landowners, well, you're going to have some jealousy there, right? Now, it, it wasn't like you had a whole bunch of, of toffs, which is kind of a, a slang term, a negative slang term for, uh, English, uh, aristocrats. They, they came up and took over Scotland and the Highlands. Uh, most of it was still clans that ran up. Most of them were clans that were affiliated or allies with the Scot or the British crown. Um, but even in today's age, I've interviewed landowners that, happened to be lucky in business uh, 20 years ago and bought 5,000 acres. I mean, we have, I mean, it's kind of a common thing here in the United mm. States, right? You know, if you, if you had, you know, or maybe you invest, you know, invested really well, or you ran a good business and, you know, at 60, 70 years of age, you decide you want to have a ranch and you go out to Montana and buy yourself a couple thousand acres or 10,000 acres. 5,000 acres where yeah. you live is different than 5,000 well, acres it is here there. in the yeah. East, right? And Which, so that's, that's the other thing that is, is that when you look at Scotland, uh, and I don't know, don't quote me on the exact number, but approximately 80% of the land mass is owned by about four to 450 people of which the largest landowner in Scotland is a Scandinavian clothing billionaire who is into rewilding and he has bought up all of these sporting estates. So, so let's get back on the history. Just one second. Yeah, we sure. talked about Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Well, she came and fell in love with the Scottish Highlands, bought Balmoral. But the reason why she liked it so much is because it was full of, full of stags, red, red deer, full of salmon in the river D and had all kinds of red grouse, which is their native red grouse that's there. And so that initiated the Victorian era of sporting estates, because when the queen did it, well, everybody else had to do it, right? It's kind of like Jackie O wearing a, 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 a leopard jacket, and everyone had to have a leopard jacket in the 1960s, and of yeah. course, a lot of leopards got killed. So the reality there is that, is that she ushered in this age, and so it's become this kind of in, entrenched tradition, a culture of hiring a gamekeeper to manage the land. Just like we'd hire a wildlife biologist or hire a, a ranch manager or a farm manager or something like that. You know, they're going to manage the land to, to the interest of the landowner. Well, the landowner wants to enjoy the sport of hunting, which um, we're not talking about, a, you know, a physical sport here like basketball or anything or baseball. We're talking about the ethics of being out there and having a quarry that is challenging. And so they started to, to, uh, to do whatever they could to increase the populations of red grouse so that they could use beaters to drive them to what they call um, butts, or, you know, which is a, a blind, basically. And you put a line of these things out and hate eight guys there. And if they could get the population to a certain number, then they could have people drive these, these, uh, these birds to them and they could have the, the opportunity to, sh to, to, to shoot them. It's a little bit different than what we do here in North America. Yeah. You know, it's not like that, but they do have walk-up shooting with dogs, which is similar to what we have, say, for pheasant hunting or any upland bird here in North America. Uh, but also they were very much in the stalking of the red stag. So the keeper or the deer stalker would take out the landowner or his friends and they would do a stalk just like we stalk in, in Montana for a mule deer mm -hmm. or an elk. Go up and it's very traditional walking, you know, uh, walking sticks and they have these uh, instead of spotting scopes that we have, they have these telescopic, yeah. you know, deal. That's pretty cool. But the other thing too, is that this tradition also ushered in the age of tweed and people go, well, tweed's kind of this, that's kind of, what is this stuff all about? And I says, well, it's actually, every estate has its own tweed pattern. It's a mm -hmm. uniform and, and basically it's designed to hide them and melt and mold them into basically the, the Heather Moreland. It's a camo. So it's a camo. It's camouflage. Yeah. So if you really look at it and you see guys laying around out in the heather, it's like, mm, yep, sure. Is. Yeah. And, but it's also a uniform. So when you go to a drive for a, for bird drive, or you're out with a bunch of other people stalking, you see people in different, different patterns of tweed, you can start to pick out what estates they're from. Huh. And the estate owners wear the same tweed and everything else. So, uh, so it's a real fascinating culture. What's going on. Of course, in the, down in, you know, you have, used to have incredible, um, salmon fishing in Scotland. I, I don't get into it in the film because that's the film is you will find out when people do watch it. It's a very complex story. What's going on over there, but, uh, they pretty well destroyed all of their mm. salmon stocks, whether it's over oh, harvesting out in the ocean, they allowed the Norwegians to put in all kinds of, uh, open net salmon farms along the Western coast, which obviously carry large numbers or the real burden of, of parasites and, and disease. Mm. And of course there's, there's all kinds of crazy things that go on with it. That's a film all by itself. Yeah. Um, but you don't see salmon like you used to huh. anymore. I mean, they used to fish the salmon. So, so, I mean, that was like the, the McNabb is like the big deal to, 
to get a stag, to shoot a grouse and catch a salmon in the same day. Today, trying to do that, it's almost impossible. Mm. So because of what's happened you know, over time. So now you have these guys that are doing conservation, wisely using the land. And, uh, so this is the keepers, the gillies, the stalkers. And then now you've got this rewilding group that has a, a better idea for the land. They want to see trees where there hasn't been. Now, remember, there wasn't trees on the land in 1750, and it wasn't because people cut them all down. That's the way nature designed it. And so now you've got a group of people who have decided that they would like to see the land. Well, first of all, they don't like people managing for the grouse. They don't like to see large numbers of deer because they claim the deer, which I don't blame the deer if, if you happen to live uh, yeah, on, on the more Heather Moorland and it's winter and there is a stand of trees there. You and I would go stand in the trees on a windy, rainy, snowy mm -hmm. day. Well, the deer will do the same thing. But if you have a bunch of young saplings that you've just planted, well, the deer are going to pop the head yeah. of those things because it's nutritional. Right. Um, so that deer have become almost evil. Uh, wow. and it's fascinating because who's never seen a, a bottle of whiskey, scotch whiskey that doesn't have a. A stag, a red sure. stag on it. I mean, it's the iconic, you know, Lance here did the painting of the monarch on the glen. And I mean, we all associate, you know, I think just about anybody else anything about Scotland associates a, a red stag with the Highlands, right? Mm -hmm. And so we now are in a scenario where this group of rewilders have pretty well determined that having large densities of deer is bad. And we need to reduce the deer population to the point where we almost want to exterminate them from the land because we want to allow for the wildlife, you know, for the, or for not wildlife, but for the trees to be able to grow. And of course you have the, the, uh, the, um, the grouse moors, which is this highland land that we're talking about, this heather moorland. And these people are, you know, they're managing it. Like we said, low intensity burning, suppression of ground predators, just like we do here for quail and turkeys in North America. And, uh, these people have decided that they're going to use that to stop this. And they basically say, well, burning is lending itself to global warming. Now, I don't know which said I tell how big Scotland is, what global warming effect there is that comes off of the muir burn from what I've seen and read in science is pretty negligible. Huh. And I, I literally asked, uh, you know, I go, why are you guys pushing this whole thing about global warming and stuff? And then the rewilders say, well, we want to set a precedence. We want to be an example to the world. And I said, well, what is the actual carbon footprint of Scotland? Because, you know, it used to be, you know, it was a, you know, used to build ships there. You know, of course, they've got the oil fields up on the northern slope there, you know, in the, in the North Sea. But that's, you know, declining dramatically. And th there really isn't much of a, of a footprint there when it comes to the carbon emissions. Yeah. So it seems like a stretch. Yeah, it's all, well, all of this can, it's like, okay, to me, it's about science, right? Because at the end of the day, we have to have a common denominator that we can all agree on, peer-reviewed science. And then I start hearing all these stories. Well, really what it comes down to, Fred, is that you just have a group of people who have a better idea how to use the land. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And that we're going to go ahead and enact whatever laws, rules, policies, and regulations because we have the ear of the politicians down in the population about Glasgow and Edinburgh. And we're going to do everything we can to, to get at those evil landowners. And the byproduct that is is that the rural communities that live on the landscape, the keepers, the gillies, the stalkers, they're screwed. I mean, they can't do what they do. And the way the system is set up, when you get hired to be a keeper at an estate, as long as you do your job, you're there for life. Uh. You know, it's not a corporate ladder. You're there. They provide you with a home, provide you with your utilities. They give you a salary. They give you a vehicle. And they give you all the equipment you need to do that. Now, some guys will buy things here and there, guns and things like that. But they, you know, most of these guys are out trapping. Uh, you know, using snares, uh, using certain types of lethal traps for um, the, the common animals that are being managed are foxes, uh -huh. which are using snares and they're, and they're shooting. And then they're also going after stoats, which is a weasel uh -huh. and, um, and uh, rats, things like that. They go after the ground nesting birds, yep. grouse, uh, goes after their eggs and their chicks. And so just of the last month, the Scottish government banned the use of all snares. Oh, um, the Muir burn, which we talked about, uh, they do this very, very intense burning. And I say intense, it's these little small quarter, half acre pieces that they map out with GPS. They figure out that if you take the Heather, they figured out over the, over hundreds of years that if you do low intensity burning in small little patches, it creates new fresh growth. You get new buds on, on the, uh, what they call rank Heather, which is the older Heather. And about 20-year rotationals, and it varies depending on where you're at and what elevation, but about 20-year rotations, they'll burn each of these areas. 
And that new bud growth growth provides for food for the grouse and other animals that use it. And it also opens up the area a little bit more so that the, the so that the uh, birds can see predators come in, especially. Yeah, well, it's, it's got to be like we were just talking with NWTF here a little while ago was creating that brood habitat. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly. And clearing exactly. the forest floor so it's not all gummed up so they can access the food, the protein that yep. they need to become adult grouse and, and hide from predators. Yeah, so we know it works. Yeah. But we have a group of people who decided it's not going to work for them because, again, we're getting back to that class warfare the oppressed or the oppressors. You got people here that are jealous, like, well, this guy's got this big estate. And of course, you know, we, they haven't had a revolution over there. They don't have kind of, you know, the history like we have as far as, you know, you can generate a bunch of money running a business and go buy something. Now, there are people that do that. I mean, I've talked to guys that in the last 20 years, they've just had a good business and they were able to buy their 5,000 acre grouse more. And, uh, and they're doing everything they can to, to hold on to something that's important to them. Now, one thing that's very interesting, there isn't a single estate, and sporting estate, an estate that's even being rewilded, that makes money. All of this is underwritten by the government. You want to go ahead and, and save the planet and do carbon sequestration, there's a beer company called BrewDog that bought a, about a 10,000 and 15,000 acre estate. And the first thing they did was they fired everybody, all the gamekeepers, everybody like that. There was a bunch of houses, all these estates had homes on them. Well, they subdivided those off and sold them off to get the money. Now, what was left was basically the hills, you know, the Heather Moreland. And uh, they went ahead and brought out excavators. And because you've got to dig holes through the iron higher pan in order to be able to plant trees, because if you plant a tree there, the roots won't be able to penetrate it. And they've been able to get carbon credits from European carbon ca- credit street screams. And the government gave them a million pounds to plant the trees. Is that what this is all about? Yep. Carbon credits? That's part of it. Oh, my God. Yeah. So you've got oh. that going on. But the key thing, that's just one part. So of let's it. destroy a natural habitat. Well, it's even better than that. So the UN says that the heather ecosystems in the United Kingdom, the UK possesses about 60 to 70% of the world's heather ecosystem. Scottish Highlands possess the vast majority of it. So think about it this way. If we had an ecosystem of concern of which we had in the United States, 60 or 70% of it you know, anywhere in the world, you started rolling in excavators and start digging up the land, destroying the heather, killing it, digging holes. They're you know, frauds. Destroying that. My point is this. Every environmental organization in the United States would be suing them within minutes. Of course. Yeah, but not over in Scotland. We can't, we can't drill in a certain area to you know, tap into our own resources yeah. because a mouse or a grouse, which I appreciate, yeah. you know, to the point you're going to wipe out an entire ecosystem for your follow the money. That is a fraudulent, if I've ever heard. hundred percent. And so the thing is, is, getting back to this, this isn't about what's best for the land. It's not what's best for the wildlife. Clearly. It's not what science says. I mean, science, peer-reviewed science says if you stop managing a grouse more within 10 years, it loses 50, I mean, 50% of its biodiversity. Now, the stated policy of the Scottish government is to have by 2035 a zero net loss in biodiversity and by 2040 to have a net gain. So if you are facilitating the destruction of grouse moors through regulations, through rules, through laws, so that the landowner doesn't realize any kind of benefit and doesn't have to make money off this because all these estates are subsidized, either be the government, corporations, or the private landowners. I mean, these grouse moors, they don't generate, you know, these guys, some of these guys told me that they spent upwards of eight, 900,000 pounds. So in US dollars, that's about 1,200, 1.2, 1.3 million dollars out of their own pocket to pay for the keepers, to get the equipment, to do the maintenance and do all the things they have to do in order to have the opportunity to go out and hunt the animals that they want to hunt on their land. Now, you and I would look at this and say, well, what's wrong with that? over in Scotland, because they're a landowner, they're considered evil. Yeah. And so we got to do everything we can to, to make it as difficult for these people to do their conservation work, the wise use of financial resource on their land. Rewilding, I, some of it sounds great, but you know, we have a situation where, you know, they want to see trees everywhere. They've romanticized trees, but they also want to see lynx, bears, wolves come back on the landscape. And in many cases, those species haven't been on that landscape for hundreds of years. And you've got somewhere they rid of about seven or eight million sheep, which is the largest industry is agriculture still in Scotland. 
Um, I don't know about you, but we've got lots of wolves in Montana. Yeah. And some over there. Say goodbye might, to your sheep. They might be in for a, a, a rude awakening, but it's all part of, of power and control. So you have these rewilding groups that, I mean, their whole purpose is, is to affect change in order to have control and power. I mean, they're, they've brought back beavers into this area, into Scotland and in the UK, um, which, you know, it may, makes sense. You know, you want to have some beavers and that. I have no problem with that. But you, you can't just start throwing things in willy-nilly. And they don't use science from, you know, what I see in the rewilding side, nobody wants to quote science. And when you start to quote science about what they're doing may or may not be the right thing to move forward, their first reaction is, well, I don't believe the science. It's, it's tainted because it came from X, Y. I said, it's peer-reviewed science. Okay. It's like your blood is blue. Human blood is blue until it gets exposed to air and it turns red. I mean, that's pretty well known. That's a, that's a fact. But these people refuse to listen to that. And there's such hypocrisy in this whole, oh, this whole yeah, thing yeah. because take an issue they care about and the science is good. This is, oh, okay. yeah. this is very frustrating. But, and for me, this is about educating you know, yeah. the broader public, the broader Western civilization about, you know, what is wildlife and habitat conservation and why is it important? Mm -hmm. Eight billion humans on the planet. We need people to be good s stewards, shepherds of the land. Wildlife doesn't live in cities doesn't live in suburbia. I mean, yeah, you get some there, but it's not like it is everywhere else. Wildlife lives in the rural, you know, the rural landscape. And it's the people that live with wildlife that need to realize a benefit from their hard work in wildlife and habitat conservation because it provides for their most basic human rights, provides for jobs, and yeah. feed their family, provides for opportunities of access to education, healthcare, all those things that we take for granted in, in the urban Western world. And so we have to realize that if you do want to see those birds in your bird feeder, if you want to see those deer and turkey in your backyard, or you want to see these iconic species like elephants and lions or, or our golly wild sheep, then somebody better be spending the money on conservation and conservation ain't cheap. And no, some, and some, our whole community it. knows that. Yep, exactly. But the rest of the world doesn't quite understand right. that. So our whole goal friend on this is to tell, give a voice to these people, uh -huh. these rural communities, these rural folks, so they can talk about the relationship. More on that, that, that ability, like I said, to provide for them. And when you start to take things at that level, because if you start talking about what our, we talked about earlier, our historic um, conservation wins have been in North America, you know, the amount of money we've generated, the acres that we've conserved, the animals we brought back from extinction, it really doesn't mean anything to the 39-year-old house chef in Hoboken, New Jersey, so, or anywhere else in the world, in the Western world. But that being able to bring it back to that human sense of, you know, you know what, this is how these guys raise their family. This is how they have the opportunities. And by what they do gives us these things that you want, right? You want healthy forest and what vibrant wildlife populations and clean drinking water. And if anybody doesn't want that stuff, you're not human. No. So. As we wrap here, um, is this occurring anywhere else that you're aware of outside of Scotland and this rewilding movement and well, absolutely. So we just started a film in Montana called the real Yellowstone. So yeah, it's a little bit of a playoff of, of, uh, the Yellowstone series. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we're working with multi-generational ranching families. So four five, six generations, which that's about as it, 150 years is max you get. And we do have some families that have been on the land that long. And we are letting them tell us their story about their relationship with the land and the wildlife. And it's it just fascinating, the stories that are going on. I mean, we're working with the Seaven Livestock Company, which the family's been there for 150 years. And uh, it's fa they're mimicking, it's a cow-calf operation, 60,000 acres, central Montana. And they're mimicking what the bison did to the land. So it's regenerative farming or ranching. Yeah. And it's basically, the idea is that they're taking you know, 100 or 1,000 head of stock and putting them in a, in a very small area for a day. And they, the animals obliterate the area. Um, not in a negative way, obliteration it just means when it looks like, it looks like a bomb went off because everything's eaten. Yeah. Uh, but the animals have defecated there. They, what happens. Circle of life. Yeah. Well, what happens because of that, you know, the bison didn't sit in one place right. all day long. They move from right. place to place every day. So they're mimicking that. And what it does is it creates much more vibrant, healthy soil life, mm. the soil health. Uh, it creates, um, uh, literally you lose any kind of ground cover that means lack of ground cover. So all your soils are covered up. Now with vegetation, and it creates and allows for more moisture to stay in the ground. And so I literally witnessed an area where a wildfire come over from public land that wasn't managed that way. And when it got to the fence line, the fire stopped. No kidding. Yeah. I'm and bad. so really fascinating story. But there's all kinds of, of conflict when it comes to 
the fact uh, the politics of wildlife management in Montana. I mean, we just had a big thing with elk management. And of course, we've, we've got some issues with land ownership where you've got people coming in from outside of Montana that don't have traditional ranching experience and values and things like that. They just want to have their piece of Montana. I mean, Robert, I mean, uh, Rupert Murdoch bought the, you know, a 250,000 acre ranch last year. Uh, you know, of course they're hiring people to run these things, but the reality there is that you have a group called American Prairie Reserve that's come in to central Montana, south of Malta, and their stated goal is to create the very first million acre private national park in the United States. Where does their funding come from? Very, very, very old East Coast and European sources. And they have more money than most people have. And they're going up and buying ranches that are, that are basically uh, in between sections of, of BLM, Bureau of Land Management land in that area. Most of it's BLM. And then you've got cattle ranches that historically have leased those BLM lands for grazing rights. Well, these guys want to go ahead and bring bison back in, and that's what they're doing. And they want the bison to be considered a wild animal. But you and I as hunters, yeah, it sounds like a cool idea. But you have to understand what happens to the local communities when you sell all these ranches. And they're selling them freely, so there's nothing against the ranchers. But what happens to the communities when you don't have any kids going to school? What happens when you don't have people going into the restaurant or toast towns? Yeah, you end up literally ripping the fabric out of these families or in these communities. And so, uh, you know, there, there's some question of that. Plus, you know, I've, I've been, there's another guy, a group of guys that uh, are ex-Navy SEALs that are, that are ranching. They're trying to, trying to uh, kind of upset the the traditional cow-calf uh, business model by utilizing some of the um, things they've learned as, as Navy SEALs, you know, they're problem solvers. Uh. And, uh, you know, I asked them a question about APR being on the landscape and buying this up. And they says, you know, it's all fine and dandy, but, you know, there's an issue here that comes to mind to us. And I go, what's that? I'd never thought about this. They said, well, the United States is one of a handful of countries in the world that's completely self-sufficient in food production. So if you go ahead and take all this land out of production, what happens if we have a situation? It now becomes a national security issue. Interesting thought. Uh, just like our energy. Yeah. It's all outsourced, just like the chips only come from one little island that we have to pay attention to. Yeah. Because we don't do anything. Just like our medicine is from everywhere else but here. But we do make lots of chips in, uh, uh, in Kalispell, Montana, by the way. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Yeah, Mike, I think it's Mike Ryan. Good. Bring more back. Yeah. Have more control of our destiny. Yeah. Well, we've had a lot of people move to Montana since COVID. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you have. Also, I'm from California, but they seem to be pretty good folks. But they Don't still drive California they, it up. They still drive like they're in California. That's yeah. it's kind of scary. But, <laughs> but yeah. So we got some really great films. We're also working on another film that actually came out of uh, three years ago out of this conference. Uh, we were uh, did the presentation of Killing the Shepherd there, which obviously is about a black community in Zambia. And uh, a couple of days later, uh, the fellow Mark Duda from Responsive Management kind of gave us the state of the state of the hunting and what's going on and whatnot. And one of the comments he made was, you know, that blacks, black Americans don't hunt uh, or in any, any numbers of black Americans. And that evening at a cocktail party, I, I had Representative Jesse Chisholm from Memphis come up to me and, and friendly introduced us. And he's like, you know, all that research we heard. I said, yes, sir. And he says, it was all bullpucky. And I go, what do you mean? And he, he went on. He says, you know, when you guys do this focus group research, do you think we, when you call us up, do you think we tell you we got a gun in the house? Now, I originally was born and raised in Detroit, Fred. I know exactly what the man was talking Yeah. About. Instantly. I mean, the light bulb was instantaneous. And so we went on and talked a little bit. And I'll tell you what, we've, we've started to develop this film about black American sportsmen and their relationship with the land and that and the history. You know, we, you know, nothing's off the table. Slavery, racism, everything like that. And, you know, one of the fascinating things, we've done a bunch of interviews and, and one of the guys, I said, you know, do you see racism out there in, 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 in hunting and in fishing? No, no, nah, nah, we're, all, we're all the same. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter how much money is in your bank account, but we're out there in nature. We're all together. And, it, you know, it, it's in some of the things they said, you know, I, Jesse, I'll, I'll tell you just a little thing here. I said, and Jesse, what, why do you hunt? I said, you know, Tom, I hunt so I can be closer to God. I'll tell you what, Fred. When people really tell you that story and they tell you it the way they do, it, it's, uh, it sends chills down your spine. It's so authentic. It's so real. And that's what all my films are about. Yeah. It's about the that authenticity of the human race and the responsibility we have to this planet, to everything that lives in it. And the fact that we also have to be much better neighbors with all the other creatures on it. Mm. We have the ability to do that. And that's what we need to do because we do want to leave this place, but we found it. Indeed. And thank goodness for you and your, your capability to 
put good stuff together and, and show it to the world. So looking forward to the the viewing and uh, continue the good work. Yeah, in the film, uh, The Last Keeper will be starting to roll out on film festivals February, March of this next year. Uh, it'll probably be, have a limited theatrical run, probably a Fathom event steal in nice. late spring, early early summer. Uh, but then it'll start to roll out. The last film, Kill the Shepherd, is now available on Amazon, Tubi, Apple TV, uh, YouTube, uh, all kinds of curiosity yeah. streams. So if you Google, uh, you know, go to shepherdswildlife.org, you can find all kinds of information of what we're doing and what's going on. And you can Google any of these films and uh, you'll find them all over the place. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Thanks for so much. Thanks to CSF for doing what they do. You bet. Thanks so much. Cheers. How about it, man? <laughs> I know I kind of put some stuff out there in a pretty simplistic way, but I have a genuine, genuine curiosity about this stuff. So I'm not doing the play up to you guys or, or you know, play up to the guests. I, you, know, you can't know everything. So I have real questions that I want to get answered. So it's always great when someone like Tom is able to uh, entertain them and, 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 you know, kind of go down those rabbit holes as it, as it were. Um, rewilding, like that's crazy to me. I just, it's such a weird concept. And I, you know, in this particular situation we were talking about, I just, I don't get it. Uh, maybe I'm not supposed to get it. Maybe that's part of the, the illusion there, but, uh, looking forward to the last keeper coming out when it does, um, certainly follow Tom shepherds of wildlife society. Socially, uh, you can go to shepherds of wildlife.org. That's where the, um, as other films are, uh, upcoming stuff. You can follow them socially there as well. So, um, do check that all out and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Tom. Uh, it's always, always a pleasure, always fascinating when I, uh, I get a chance to sit down with him and I doubt it will be the last time. So thank you so much folks in the, in the coming next episodes. Uh, I'm very happy to bring to you partners, um, NASC leadership. Uh, we're going to deep dive some, some policy stuff that's going on at the federal level, at the state levels. So, uh, we're going to welcome in some, some friends from Turkey Federation, Trappers Association. We did a pretty cool deal where we had most of our executive council, uh, past presidents, and current president, Representative uh, Jeff Goldie from the great state of New Hampshire. They sat down and kind of went through a, a history of, of NASC, how it started, you know, what were the goals and inspirations, where were, you know, what the middle of the road was, and then the road we're on now. Where are we going? Uh, we're going to talk to some friends from, well, a friend from Pheasants Forever and, and some CSF staff as it concerns. Uh, uh, farm bill at some point as we release these. Uh, we're going to get the fisheries, rigs to reef. Uh, rigs to reef, uh, thing that's going on down there in the Gulf states. Uh, our our uh, policy director on fisheries, Chris Horton, joins us with Mike Leonard of uh, ASA. So that is forthcoming. Keely Hopkins, you guys know her. Uh, she's been on the program once before, CSF uh, manager in the North. Uh, in the Western States, um, joined by like a, a frequent flyer, Bill, uh, Bill Gaines is going to join us on there from NSSF. Jake McGugan is going to join us. Jake, I hope I got that right. I, for whatever you, you guys will find out Had a hard time with that last name. Jake is awesome. Jake is a, a New England guy as well. So, uh, me and Jake get to chop it up. Uh, so we're talking about merchant tracking on that particular one, and then we get into more firearm policy, things that are going on around the nation. So you want us to tune in for that one. Uh, and then we have some more lighthearted stuff. We're going to talk social media as it relates to policy, telling our story. We got our, our, our buddy, Chef Josh, joining us to talk about cooking, to talk about, uh, you know, being good stewards of the, the meat we harvest every year and how to maximize that. And we kind of, we kind of dive deep on some other stuff there as, as, you know, feeding yourself and harvesting your own food is, is, is empowering and what that means to our community. So we got all that coming up as we roll down the line here. So like I said, no shortage of outstanding conversations coming your way. So do stay tuned and make sure guys, if you're not signed up for the 
Sportsman's Voice, EPUB. Do that. You'll get announcements there. Follow us socially, Instagram, Facebook, X. We'll put out uh, teasers, announcements there on the next coming shows. We may release some of these in a bonus fashion. So we got this one coming, probably going to do one next Thursday and then one through the holiday break. So uh, we'll be content rich uh, here for, for quite some time. And then as we head into the new year, lots of planning going on, lots of sessions coming back in again after the holidays. So we are not slowing down here at CSF. Our regional staff, our federal staff, and uh, if there's breaks, man, we've already gone through the floorboard. So, uh, but this is this is great because we get to be able to bring that to you here on this medium, and so you know what's going on. We do our best to you know, put some of the bigger issues on here, and then bring folks on, as you well know, to talk more about them, and and you know keep up what's going on uh, in your backyard and and down on the hill as well. So. Um, that's it for this show. I hope you enjoyed it as always, as the, as the out bumper says, you know, like subscribe rate where available. That really helps, you know, our, our, our program here, our still very new fledgling program, uh, to get seen, you know, those algorithms, how they, they work. The more people interact with it, the more the stuff rises to the top. So we think we got some pretty good stuff here, and we'd like to see that cream rise. Uh, you guys are part of that, and you can make that happen for us. So if you see five stars, fill all five of them in. If there's an opportunity to leave a review, hey, this was great. Boom, write it down. If uh, if you feel strongly about it, you know, and it was really great, then really put that down there. If um, if you're not digging it, well, just move on. Don't no need to leave a review we're good with the your silence there i don't think anyone's not liking the content i think i'm certainly having a good time with it i know our guests are really enjoying uh, the opportunity to put this stuff out there so um just keep listening and then feel free to grab these links roll them in your social feeds man that would be fantastic if you're on x you know uh drop drop a link to one of these tag your tag your local uh, po- uh legislators tag your your federal congressmen and and senators and say hey this is this is going on you need to check this out this is important to me like never in our history have we had a direct line to to our lawmakers like we do in present day and they look at them they definitely read them their staff definitely gets a hold of them they get when you at them or you hashtag them you know whatever they they definitely see this stuff and their handlers and like i said their staff they see it, and if it rises, you know, if there's something there, they're gonna they're gonna let their their lawmaker know. Um, you know, Joe Schmo just got real fired up about lead bans in in Maine, and wants you know someone to know about it and how that's gonna be detrimental or uh, things like that. So, at any rate, you guys have that power. You guys can be engaged. That's a common theme you're gonna hear. Uh, probably always on the show, but definitely throughout the NAS recordings, um, the ability to just reach out, know who your legislators are, and communicate with them and be be in their space, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. So, all right, that's it. Uh, this week's show, like I said, we got another one coming. We're going to go back to back to back right through the holidays into the new year. If you don't hear from me, uh, you, you don't have time to listen to this here over the holidays, do have a Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Be safe out there. If you're still hunting, again, safe shooting. Get home safely to your friends and family. We want to have good uh, good holidays here and, and a happy and healthy New Year. Until next time, thanks so much for taking us along. You're part of the day. See you later. Thanks for joining us on this edition of the Sportsman's Voice podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Your support is crucial, and you can help us out right now by leaving a review, filling in those five stars where available, sharing this episode with friends and family, and engaging with us socially. CSF can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. Together, we can protect the outdoor sports we love and continue to keep you informed wherever you are.
That's it for this week. Until next time, we'll see you later.